<laughs> this, this is the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. I'm Stephen A. Guess who's back? Guess who's back? Welcome to the latest edition of the Stephen A. Smith Show, coming at you as I love to do every weekday over the airwaves of ESPN Radio, 250-plus markets across the United States of America, plus ESPN Radio on Sirius XM, Channel 80. Number to call up as always is 888-SAY-ESPN. That's 888-729-3776. I am coming at you live, live from Cleveland, Ohio, site of Game 3 of the NBA Finals scheduled to take place at Quicken's Loans Arena a.k.a. The Q, tomorrow night, Wednesday night. Looking forward uh, to that game. Cavaliers' uh, championship aspirations are on the line. If they lose, no team in NBA history has overcome a 3-0 deficit to win an NBA Finals. And I promise you, this won't be the first. They lose tomorrow night. It's a wrap. We all know that. That's something that we'll definitely get into. Our number two, one of the greatest fighters in the world, pound for pound, Got a welterweight championship fight this Saturday night in Vegas. You can catch it on the ESPN app. The great Terrence Crawford goes up against Joe Horn, the man that defeated Manny Pacquiao last summer uh, for the welterweight crown. Remember, Terrence Crawford is moving up from junior welterweight to welterweight for this fight. Uh, So it'll be real interesting to talk to him about what his expectations are. He and I have spoken many occasions, uh, but this is the first time I'll be actually interviewing him. I'm looking forward, on on radio that is, I'm looking forward to that conversation. But before we do anything, we know where we have to go today. Because we know what the news is today. In case any of you did not know, you've been living under a rock and you didn't realize what transpired. Um, The White House specifically the President of the United States, canceled the Philadelphia Eagles' visit to the White House. Okay? And being who he is, how he can be, you know, in terms of stealing the narrative, and he's done it, ladies and gentlemen. He's hijacked the narrative. Make no mistake about it, this is the latest nugget of evidence uh, to give to you. The Eagles were scheduled to attend after winning the Super Bowl championship, obviously. Uh, They were scheduled to attend today, June 5th. And um, the president changed his mind, evidently because only a handful of Philadelphia Eagles were going to show up. The president and the White House issued a statement uh, yesterday afternoon. And then they issued a statement today. Two different statements. Nevertheless, you deserve to hear both. The first one that they issued yesterday said the following. The Philadelphia Eagles are unable to come to the White House with their full team to be celebrated tomorrow. They disagree with their president because he insists that they proudly stand for the national anthem, hand on heart, in honor of the great men and women of our military and the people of our country. The Eagles wanted to send a smaller delegation, but the 1,000 fans planning to attend the event deserve better. These fans are still invited to the White House to be part of a different type of ceremony, one that will honor our great country, pay tribute to the heroes who fight to protect it, and loudly and proudly play the national anthem. I will be there at 3 p.m. with the United States Marine Band and the United States Army Chorus to celebrate America. That was President Trump in the White House statement yesterday. As of a couple of hours ago, today, the White House modified their statement to some degree. And this is what they had to say. Quote, after extensive discussions with the Eagles organization, which began in February, the team accepted an invitation from the president to attend a June 5 celebration of their victory in Super Bowl 52 at the White House. On Thursday, May 31st, the team notified the White House of 81 individuals, including players, coaches, management, and support personnel who would attend the event. On Friday, the Secret Service cleared them for participation. These individuals, along with more than 1,000 Eagles fans, were scheduled to attend the event. Late Friday... Citing the fact that many players would not be in attendance, the team contacted the White House again 
and attempted to reschedule the event. The president, however, had already announced that he would be traveling overseas on the dates the Eagles proposed. The White House, despite sensing a lack of good faith, nonetheless attempted to work with the Eagles over the weekend to change the event format that could accommodate a smaller group of players. Unfortunately, the Eagles offered to send only a tiny handful of representatives while making clear that the great majority of players would not attend the event despite planning to be in D.C. today. In other words, the vast majority of of the Eagles team decided to abandon their fans. couple of things. Mr. President, White House, could y'all make up y'all mind? Because in one hand, you basically accuse them of being unpatriotic. In this go-round, you're accusing them of abandoning the fans. Which one is it? That's point number one. Point number two. Having heard all the evidence, President canceling the event, believe it or not, if practically no one was going to show up but 10 people, according to the reports, why bother? I think that's legitimate. I mean, if only 10 people is going to show up, the team is saying, hell with you. We don't want we don't want to come to the White House to celebrate. So I have no problem with him canceling the event under those conditions. I wouldn't have the event if it were just for 10 people. I wouldn't have a ceremony. I wouldn't have that. I mean, that's embarrassing to him. That's embarrassing to the White House. It's just not a good look. Why bother? Point number three. It gets a little dicey here. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, here's the bigger issue. Here's the issue that no one is really engaging in. We're getting in the back and forth to the right and wrongs of the president and uh, forget all that. We all know that he's wrong because we know he hijacked the issue and turned it into something that it was not about. It was never about patriotism. Football players were not speaking against this country. They were speaking that there are remnants and elements of this country that isn't living up to what this country is supposed to stand for. So they don't have a problem with our nation. They don't have a problem with what our nation stands for. They have a problem with the people in this country who exercise totally totally something different than what the country purportedly stands for and stands on. There's a difference. There is a difference. Hell, you speak against this country. I got a problem with you. You speak against the actions of some within this country, that's a different thing. The principles that this country stands upon, what it's predicated on, I'm a proud American. Those in position of power and how they choose to modify rules to their own making and their own liking and what they choose to do with it because they're in positions of power, Those are the people I have a problem with. That's not having a problem with the country. That's having a problem with you, whoever that you is. We live in very, very trying times. And to me, when I listen, I read those statements and I listen to what the president and the White House has to say. It's public relations. It's grandstanding. It's giving forth a different imagery than what's actually going on. You're talking about players standing for the national anthem, respecting our flag. You swifted it to you. You shifted it to an issue of patriotism. Colin Kaepernick's protest or those from Eric Reed and others who have followed him was never about patriotism. It was about racial inequality, injustice and issues that law enforcement were having with minority communities in our country. That's what the issue was about. Issues that we all have acknowledged actually exist. President hijacked the issue, made it about something it totally was not about. And its constituency, which spans at least, at minimum, 62 million strong, 
have fallen for it hook, line, and sinker. But whether the president is right or wrong is irrelevant. If you're the National Football League, how are you feeling right now? Your puppets on a string. That's the story. The story isn't President Trump being President Trump. The story isn't President Trump and whether or not he's engaging in evasive tactics or, you know, whatever the case may be. Because guess what? You Google him and you get to see Eagles, National Anthem, and Trump. You don't get to see the Russia investigation. You don't get to see immigration. You don't get to see the issues or news about a wall. You don't get to see budget deals trying to be reached. You don't get to see uh, whether or not he's willing to pardon himself. Or clips from Rudy Giuliani on with George Stephanopoulos one minute or Sean Hannity the next. You don't get to focus on that. You don't get to pay attention to that. It doesn't matter. Why? Because the narrative has been hijacked. And as a result, you get to focus on what he wants you to focus on. And that's fine. You might hate on him for it. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to admit it's kind of brilliant. You got to admit it. I mean, you just got to admit it. When it comes to PR, Damn it, Donald Trump's box office. Just call it what it is. Hate all you want to. I'm just so sick and tired of folks getting themselves up in a tizzy. He is who he is. And oh, by the way, he always told you and showed you that was him. Tell me when you've ever heard him admit he's wrong. Why do you think I loved it when Alec Baldwin would, in, would enter, uh, uh, you know, so would spoof him on Saturday Night Live when he sat up there and said, I would like to apologize. What? What? Apologize. Do you mean apologize? No, I would never do that. That's not what he does. And he's the ultimate self-promoter. And he's always the victim, never the villain. And Tell me what you don't know. He's our president. Like it or not. And last time I checked, this nation is the greatest nation in the world. We adapt. We overcome. We always have. We always will. LeBron James on the Eagles in the White House. It's typical of him. I'm not surprised. I know whoever wins this series won't be going, us or Golden State. That's LeBron James, a quote on Donald Trump in the White House just now. I'll repeat it. It's typical of him. I'm not surprised. I know whoever wins this series won't be going, us or Golden State. LeBron James. Nobody surprised. So my response to all of you out there who are complaining and being so up in arms about the president, grow the hell up. What's the problem? Why are we acting like we live in some dictatorship where you can't adjust and modify and adapt to the times that we're living in? The man won the election. He's the president. He's not the first president a lot of folks didn't like, and he won't be the last. This is America. We'll get over it. That's not the real story here. The real story is not about whether or not this man wants the Eagles at the White House or cancel some damn visit. This is about the National Football League, who are like puppets on a string. I don't say that gladly. I don't say that proudly. I'm not trying to excoriate anybody. I'm just talking fact. You're getting millions upon millions of dollars from the Department of the Defense since the 2008, 2009. You engage in what Senator John McCain out of Arizona called paid patriotism. But in the process of collecting the millions of dollars, To advocate and provoke and push and market and promote patriotism? You forget to be patriots yourself by mandating a national anthem policy? The NFL, the NBA had the policy. The Major League Baseball had the policy. National Hockey League had the policy. Where were you, National Football League? Why were you late to the party? Why did you drag your feet? Why did you not have a policy in place? So if Colin Kaepernick had elected to take a knee, he would have been in violation of that policy. 
Why did you not have that policy in, pl in place? Why were you late to the party? So late, in fact, that you didn't even exist until the president spoke up. And it was after the president spoke up that you said, we got to do something about it. And now you tried to implement this bogus national anthem policy that's bringing even more attention to the Colin Kaepernick protest. So now before, whereas we look for people who took one knee, now you got a situation where anybody who's coming out of their locker room after the anthem is being played, there's going to be the eye of the storm on them. And by the way, that's not just players. If a coach comes out there late, well, how come you weren't out there when the national anthem was being played? How about broadcasters in the media? How come y'all weren't out there when the national anthem was being played? How about team personnel? Coaches. How come y'all weren't out there when the national anthem was being played? Everybody is suddenly under a microscope. This is not going away. The National Football League got played. They got played. They look like bumbling idiots over this issue. I'm not calling them idiots. I'm not calling them bumbling idiots. I'm saying how they look over this particular issue. They look like fools. You did this to yourself. You did this. And then you did. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? They did it. Implementing this new national anthem policy that calls for you to either stand for the national anthem while you're out on the field or wait until the national anthem is over in your locker room and then come out thereafter. They implemented this policy. We have now learned. Because of the president and what he said. Jerry Jones is on a record with the whole collusion case that Colin Kaepernick filed. Jerry Jones is on a record saying he spoke to the president. Other owners acknowledge they spoke to the president. So now we have a situation where the commander in chief is on the phone with owners of National Football League teams, potentially influencing policy, which is not supposed to happen. And the NFL owners allowed themselves to be in this position. They look like fools. Absolute fools. You don't get to get around this. And you know what makes it worse for the National Football League? Not only do you look like fools for reacting directly to the president and the noise that he created with his constituency and beyond by hijacking the issue for his own purposes. By the way, also exacting his revenge upon these same owners who didn't let him in their good old boys club when he wanted to own the Buffalo Bills. Not only did you do that, but you also caused further division with your own players because this wasn't collectively bargained. You didn't consult. DeMora Smith for the Players Association is on the record stating, quote, we were lied to. We were told we would be informed of any decision before it was reached or what have you, and it would be a discussion. That's not what happened. The NFL and its owners made a unilateral decision. Obviously, Roger Goodell has to flow with them because he answers to them because he's the commissioner. And they employ him and pay him $44 million a year. So now you're in a situation where you didn't collectively bargain over this. There's no agreement between the very players you're enforcing the rules upon. And you're enforcing these rules upon them at a time where the nation appears to be more divided than ever before even though I don't know whether that's true or not. I don't think that is. But that's what people say. And they clearly have no love for this particular POTUS, President of the United States of America. So if you're a league owner, not only do you have division within the players because you didn't negotiate a collective bargaining agreement as it pertained to this issue, and you have no agreement with them, but you appear to be siding with an individual these very players don't believe has their best interest at heart. The story is not the president expressing his opinion and deciding not to invite you to a White House you didn't plan on going to anyway. 
The story is not the 10 eagles who were willing to show up. The story is how the NFL has gotten totally played in this issue and an issue that they were starving to be removed from the public eye is now front and center during the NBA finals, no less. And if the president can do this during the NBA finals, could you imagine what he's going to do once the NFL season starts? If you're Donald Trump, all you have to do is sit back, recline in your chair inside that Oval Office, kick your feet up, and relax by the phone if it comes to an issue of wondering what the NFL owners are going to do. They are, figuratively speaking, going to have to come to him on their knees, begging him not to broach the subject at all publicly. Because the second he does, tens of millions of voters who voted for him, who also patronize the NFL brand, are going to march lockstep with their president. And they're going to do his bidding. He's going to bring up the issue of patriotism. And those folks are going to say, these youngsters are so unappreciative of the opportunity this great country of ours grants them. How dare they? How dare they? And nobody's going to be in a position to stop him. The NFL owners are puppets to the president of the United States as we speak. Because they didn't ban with the players. And they didn't base their position on a moral high ground. They based their position on a bottom line. And compromise themselves for a man who happens to be the president who desperately likes compromising them because they compromised his interest, not just in 2014 when he wanted to own the Buffalo Bills, but back in the 80s when he was with the USFL and looking to become an NFL owner. He's getting them back and smiling while doing it. And after this, it's clear. There's almost nothing they can do about it. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. That was Straight Talk Wireless Nationwide Coverage on America's largest and most dependable 4G LTE networks. That is the number to call. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm just getting started. You see how Donald Trump loves messing with the NFL owners. He wouldn't dare do that to the NBA. I'll tell you why in a minute. You're listening live to the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio. I'm washing my nose, oh yeah. I'm a shower curtain, and I do one thing, keep water from leaking everywhere. So you see why I feel useless compared to Geico, who does so much more. Like, not only could Geico save you money, but they've been around for over 75 years. And they give you 24-7 access online, over the phone, or on the Geico app. And they've got a 97% customer satisfaction rating. They do all this while I have to listen to this chucklehead. Oh, good, he stopped. Washing my toes! Oh, great, an encore. Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Uh, before I get uh, uh, to the calls, a uh, couple of points that I wanted to bring up. Number one, I wanted to pause for a second, veer left, um, and give our well wishes um, to Giants general manager Dave Gettleman, New York Giants, uh, New York Giants football team uh, general manager Dave Gettleman. Stunning news uh, revealed this afternoon. He has been diagnosed with cancer. His quote is, recently I underwent an annual physical during which it was discovered I have lymphoma. Over the past week, I have undergone more testing. Outlook for the treatment and the prognosis is positive, and so am I. That's what he said. GM, assistant GM Kevin Abrams probably will take over uh, more responsibility since he's involved in all the club's day-to-day operations. Uh, get him in 67 years of age. Um, obviously, myself and many, many others out. Or you know, I don't. I don't know of anybody uh, who hasn't been hit directly or indirectly uh, by the savage illness that is cancer. And so we wish him nothing but the best. 
Um, and our, our sincere well wishes goes out to Dave Gettleman, the general manager for the New York Giants. Back to the issue at hand <clears throat> involving uh, President Trump's uh, position to cancel the Eagles trip to the White House. Uh, apparently, uh, the Eagles had given indication initially that about 81 individuals would be showing up to the White House. Um, as of last Friday, they informed the president uh, after being cleared by the Secret Service that only about 10 people would be showing. Uh, the president wasn't having that. Uh, the belief is that it was a bad look. It's not something that he wanted to be a part of, so he canceled it. <clears throat> Everybody's been in an uproar about the president and his position about the national anthem and Colin Kaepernick and patriotism. You know, I call it hijacking the narrative, the issue, which he has clearly done successfully. But to me, that's not the biggest story. The biggest story is that the NFL is at the beck and call of the president. They're at the mercy of the president of the United States of America. Because all Donald Trump has to do is tweet or speak publicly against the NFL as it pertains to the national anthem issue. This just because of what he has said during the NBA finals. Imagine when Donald Trump, if Donald Trump, I should say if, but it really is when to me, when he brings this up, come the start of the NFL season. If they were worried about last year being compromised, because you imagine how bad this year is going to be? And I'm trying to figure out who are the brainiacs that came to the conclusion that this was the route to take. Who are the brainiacs that sat up there and said this new national anthem policy where if you are on the field, you have to stand for the national anthem. But if you're not, but but if you do, you have the choice of standing in the locker room and wait. Well, all Trump and those folks are going to do is highlight the individuals that come out after the national anthem is played. And if there's anybody that's recognizable, they're going to be fodder. There's no way around it. And then to make matters worse, the National Football League didn't even discuss it with its players. They didn't collectively bargain this with its players. So you don't have their support either. It's a divide all the way around. You're the owners. You can control the players, but so much you certainly don't have any control over the president. You're like caught in the middle. It's an absolute nightmare. And since Jerry Jones is already on the record in Colin Kaepernick's collusion case, admitting he spoke to the president, and other owners may have as well, suddenly Colin Kaepernick's case against the National Football League has gained more traction. The N- the, I'm sorry, the NBA, the NFL. They look like puppets on a string with the president. They've alienated their players. I mean, this is a very divisive issue. And there's no win in it, no matter where the NFL turns. You are literally at the mercy of the president of the United States. Who's primarily about power, which we know. He likes to tell you you're fired. That's what he likes to do. So here's where we are. There's no way around this. And as a result, look at where we go from here. And you noticed. And I spoke about this on my television show first take this morning. You notice that the president never says anything about the NFL and about the NBA, right? Because, ladies and gentlemen, in the NBA, they don't wear helmets to disguise them. knee pads and everything else, you know, to block the identity or impede the identity to some degree. NBA players are wearing tank tops and shorts. NBA players are closer to the fans. And the NBA brand has successfully globalized its brand in a way the NFL can only hope for. So when you're talking about the international stage, the NFL can't even touch the NBA. Can't even touch it. Can't touch it. And because they can't touch it, look at where we are. We slice it any way we want to, but look at where we are. Let me tell you something right now. President knows exactly what he's doing by not messing around with LeBron James. LeBron James is arguably more popular than him. 
more Twitter followers, Instagram, Facebook. Plus, he's an iconic sports brand who has an incredible image. Steph Curry, the babyface assassin, ain't too far behind. The combination of those two is too much for Trump to mess with, even though he's the president. That's why you never hear him say anything about LeBron. He knows a losing battle when he's seeing it. That's just the truth. And there's no way around that. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Your phone calls up next about Trump, about the anthem, about the NFL, about the NBA and beyond. And that's before I get to Ter- Terrence Crawford, arguably the greatest pound for pound fighter in the world coming up in hour number two. Stick around. Don't touch that dial. You're listening live to Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! A little bit, I won't say breaking news, but it just came out. Fox News has apologized today after receiving a torrent of criticism over the network's use of photos of various players for the Philadelphia Eagles kneeling in prayer, creating the misleading impression that they were demonstrating during the national anthem. Um, Fox News anchor Shannon Bream explained Trump's decision uh, to cancel the Eagles' visit to the White House, which he attributed to the anthem protests that have roiled the league. But while she was doing so, photos of Eagles players kneeling in prayer were shown on the screen. One of the pictures, Eagles tight end Zach Ertz, forcefully denounced the network in a tweet on Tuesday saying, quote, this can't be serious. Praying before games with my teammates well before the anthem is being used for your propaganda? Question mark. Just sad. I feel like you guys should have to be better than this. That's what Zach Ertz wrote. Christopher Wallace, the executive producer of Bream's program, issued an apology for the error on Tuesday saying, quote, during our report about President Trump, Canceling the Philadelphia Eagles trip to the White House to celebrate their Super Bowl win, we showed unrelated footage of players kneeling in prayer. To clarify, no members of the team knelt in protest during the national anthem throughout the regular or postseason last year. We apologize for the error. Well, that just makes Fox News look bad. It makes it look intentional. Until they got caught. That's how it looks. No way around that. Casey in New Jersey, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. Hey, hey, Stephen A., how you doing? I'm all right. Go ahead, buddy. Uh, so I totally appreciate what Colin Kaepernick is doing by kneeling and everything and bringing awareness to this issue. Um, however, it started to become a, a more of a divisive issue. Um, what I would love to see is I know the NFL already brings awareness to other uh, issues such as breast cancer, uh, military appreciation, stuff like that. Why would they not come together as a players union, NFL, and the owners and, and make September a quality month? Stop right um, there. Stop right there. I don't want to hear any more of this. Let me tell you why I don't want to hear this. Because, Casey, you're letting the president off the hook. Why Why can't the president mind his business and tend to something else? I, I why, totally why doesn't anybody that bring I'm, that up? The president has nothing to do with the National Football League. If the president never says a word, is this Colin Kaepernick kneeling during the national anthem as big of an issue today as it was before the president opened his mouth and said, I'd fire all those SOBs. Yes or no? No, it's not. It's not. No. Then why, then, then, it, then why, then why, why hasn't that been a suggestion by everybody? Why can't the president tend to business concerning, you know, the Oval Office and being a commander in chief? I, I, come I nobody totally says that? agree. And I can't I can't speak for the president. I'm not going to pretend to know what he's thinking or anything like that. I'm, I'm, I'm not, not saying it either. President. All and right. I think we need to come together. They need to come together as an organization. Um, you know, I got it. Not worry about what he's saying. Well, unfortunately, and, and, they've already done that. I got to run, Casey. I appreciate the call. But unfortunately, the NFL has already showed concerns for what he is saying. Terry in Virginia, real quick. You're live with Stephen A. Go ahead. Hey, hey. Paul, or uh, Stephen uh, Smith, I love your show. And listen, I'm so fired up about this, it's killing me. I'm a 27-year military vet, and I just wish for one second that these players and your national audience will go out there and look up what that flag means. It is not a piece of material with 13 stripes and 50 stars, okay? I'll give you one. 
the red on that flag signifies the blood spilled by the people defending this country. Is that what Colin Kaepernick was protesting, sir? Hello? Terry? Look, ladies and gentlemen, that man is a 27-year veteran. Um, you can have whatever opinion you want about him. But Terry in Virginia, I want you to know that while I disagree with your opinion, I respect where you're coming from. I understand. You're very, very passionate. As a military veteran, we thank you for your service. We recognize that this is an incredibly sensitive issue to you. And I understand. But what I would beg you to understand, sir, is that Colin Kaepernick wasn't making it about patriotism. Your president did. If that was what Colin Kaepernick was protesting against, you would have a point. But that's not what he was protesting against. And if that's not what he was protesting against, that means he isn't the one that turned this into an issue that it was unrelated to. It was your president. You have to think about that, sir. And you are welcome to call back into this show anytime you like. Terrence Crawford, one of the pound for pound greats in the sport of boxing, fighting for a championship this Saturday. He's up next with Stephen A. When he has been raised. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app. This, this is the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. I'm Stephen A. Come to our number two back here on the Stephen A. Smith Show, ESPN Radio, coming at you as I love to do every weekday. 250 plus markets across the United States of America, plus ESPN Radio on Sirius XM. In approximately nine minutes or so, um, junior welterweight champion of the world, former super lightweight champion of the world, 32-0, and 0, 23 KOs. His name is Terrence Crawford, arguably the best pound-for-pound pound fighter in the world. Fighting at the MGM Grand in Vegas this Saturday night. World Boxing Organization, WBL, welterweight title of the world versus Jeff Horn. Looking forward to that fight, no question about it. Um <clears throat> And obviously, before we talk to him, uh, reminding you that we're coming at you live from Cleveland, Ohio, site of Game 3 and 4 at Quicken's Loans Arena, Wednesday and Friday night. Uh, LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers trying to stave off elimination down 0-2 in this best-of-seven NBA final series uh, to the Golden State Warriors. Game 3 is tomorrow night at the Q. And obviously, I think they need to bench uh, 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 J.R. Smith, start Kyle Korver, Make sure that, um, you know, a couple other guys get some playing time, like Rodney Hood. Rodney Hood, Kyle Corver should start. Jeff Green, Tristan Thompson, keep them in there. And LeBron James has to go berserk, but we could talk more about that. I was spent the first hour talking about President Trump and his cancellation of uh, disinviting, basically, the Philadelphia Eagles to come to the White House because only 10 members of the team were going to show up. Um, that made national news, of course. To me, it makes the NFL look bad. They look like puppets on a string since they just recently uh, instituted a new policy for the national anthem, saying if you were out on the field, uh, you had to stand for the national anthem. If you were not going to stand for the national anthem, you need to stay in the locker room for, until the national anthem is played and then come out. Because if you came out and you didn't stand for the national anthem, you could be penalized, a fine or worse. <clears throat> so all of that stuff was what was going on. The president accused the Eagles essentially of being unpatriotic, paraphrasing me, of course, but that's basically where he went with it. Well, Malcolm Butler, you remember that man, part of that players coalition that negotiated the deal with NFL owners that got him about $89 million uh, to contribute uh, to African-American and minority causes within their respective communities. Uh, he went on Twitter and wrote something today upon learning of the president's decision. And I'll read it to you verbatim from Malcolm Jenkins, linebacker for the Philadelphia Eagles. One of the best, by the way. He says, quote, it's hard to step out in the public and fight to make it better. It's hard to meet with people who don't agree with you and to have tough conversations about uncomfortable race related issues and how to make positive change. It takes empathy and time to listen to others experiences that may be different than your own. 
It takes out. It, it takes courage to stand up for the truth, even if it's not a popular one. This is what my colleagues and I have been facing for the past two years. Players have met with police departments, elected officials and community advocates around the country. Chris Long played for free last year and donated his entire salary to charity. We've fed the hungry. We've mentored our youth. We fought to create opportunities for communities and individuals who have been disenfranchised. We've given scholarships and the list goes on. We've done all of this while still climbing to win the highest esteem in our profession. We are athletes, but as citizens, we are doing everything in our power to make our communities better. This is the hard but right thing to do. It's not our job. No one elected us to do this. We do it because we love this country and our communities. Everyone, regardless of race or socioeconomic status, deserves to be treated equally. We are fighting for racial and social equality. Simply Google how many Philadelphia Eagles knelt during the national anthem last season, and you find that the answer is zero. A similar Google search will show you how many great things the players on this team are doing and continue to do on a daily basis. Instead, the decision was made to lie and paint the picture that these players are anti-American, anti-flag, and anti-military. We will continue to fight for impacted citizens and give a voice to those who never had one. Hashtag the fight continues. Malcolm Butler, Philadelphia Eagles. Terry in Virginia, if you're listening, do you see my point now? I understand that you're a veteran of the military for 27 years. We respect and appreciate and are indebted to you for your service. But the truth is the truth, sir. And the fact of the matter is no member of the Philadelphia Eagles knelt during the national anthem last year. Not one of them. And if they didn't take a knee, if they did not kneel, then you can't obviously accuse them of being unpatriotic, even though those who did take a knee weren't being unpatriotic. They were fighting for racial injustice, racial inequality, and brutality on the part of law enforcement officials to members of the minority communities. But if you want to interpret that as being unpatriotic, how then can you still justify the president's position? Not canceling the ceremony, because if only 10 people are showing up, I don't blame him. But how can you defend the president's position of tainting the Philadelphia Eagles as unpatriotic when we all know that's a lie? That's the real problem here. That's what can't be avoided. Danny in L.A., you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. Stephen A., very passionate, as you always are. My point about this, and I support all the NFL players and all the views they have. What happens next fall? But little Johnny, who's 10 years old, sees that his favorite player doesn't come out for the national anthem. And then Monday he goes to school, and he's like, you know what? I'm not going to stand up or do the Pledge of Allegiance because my favorite player doesn't believe in that as well. The president's got to stay out of this. He's got to work on everything else. And I challenge you, Stephen A., to not talk about these stupid owners until this problem is resolved. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that because I'm in a news business and my job is not to be activist, engage in activism to the point where I ignore stories that relate to my view in public. I understand and respect where you're coming from, Danny. My problem is this. For every Danny that says doesn't talk about, don't talk about them. There are millions of people who listen to this radio show and watch me on television who not only want me to, but expect me to because it's my job. And a lot of times we collect a paycheck from companies and sign on to do a job and then we want to exercise action. Activism and, re- and and ignore our response, our occupational responsibilities. I don't live by that credo. I don't live by that game. If I sign on to do a job, I'm going to do my job. When Danny listens to the Stephen A. Smith show, you expect me to address the issues that are pertinent to the public, not to do what I want to do, but to do what you would want me to do. And you have to respect that, sir. I absolutely do. And I, I appreciate that take. My question, I haven't really heard anything from the head of the Players Association, Mr. Smith. They have. They, they have they, 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 their position is that they were very upset that the owners took the position that they took in terms of modifying their policy and implementing this new policy where you have to stand out there for the national anthem or stay back in the locker room because they're saying you never talk to the players about it. It should have been something that was discussed with the Players Association and agreed upon in concert with the players. 
instead of bringing down a heavy handed rule against them. He had a problem with that and he's against the owners with this as well. Excellent. Well, thank you for your uh, tremendous work, Stephen A., and uh, keep up the great job. Thank you so much. Appreciate the call. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Whoever's next, I'm cutting you off the second I get Jamal Crawford on the line. I'm telling you that from there. Is he on the line yet? I want to make sure of that, cat. All right? Once we get Jamal Crawford on the line, I'm going straight to him. I'm not going to keep the champ waiting. But let's go to uh, Eli in Newark. You're live with Stephen A. What's going on, Eli? Hi, no, Stephen A. Uh, keep, up, keep up the good work, bro. I'm with Thank you 100%. You. Uh, I respect that uh, veteran that called. He was so passionate. I respect that. I disagree. I'm more in line with Nate Boyer. Uh, thank you for having me on your show at first take one time, not that long ago. Yes, um, thank you. The problem not going to change until until the, the Republican Congress is, is voted out of office. Today was primary day across the country. I voted already in New Jersey because they're not going to do a thing. He got everybody scared to death. You know you what? Stop right there. Stop, 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 Eli. I respect where you're coming from. I understand the partisanship that you're spinning here. That has nothing to do with the president. The president is this is not a legislative issue. This is not something that the, 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 the Republicans in Congress or the Senate need to speak on and speak out against. This is an individual who happens to be the president of the United States who has taken a very public position against the players on this particular issue. It's not a legislative issue. It's not something to be brought to Capitol Hill and debated and debated and voted upon legislatively. This is not that kind of issue. So the Republicans on Capitol Hill have nothing to do with this. There's no reason for you to bring them up. Well, wait, wait, wait. I'll take a slightly different view of that because nobody is speaking up. He's got them all tongue-tied, too. That's my point, okay? Until somebody speaks up and put it, it is, we still under a country with checks and balances, aren't we? They're not checking him. Well, 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 they've checked him on various other issues he doesn't care, number one. And number two, they have no legislative power over his mouth. No one does, or his fingers when he chooses to tweet. So the point is, you could talk about checking him all he wants to, but at the end of the day, he knows he has 62-plus million voters who have helped put him in the office. And that's his mentality. So he's going to say what he wants to say because his objective is to influence their thinking. And as long as he's influencing their thinking, he'll deal with the other stuff later. And that's just the way he stands with it. I got to get on out of here, man. I appreciate the call, Eli. On the line with us right now, as promised, is the challenger for the WBO welterweight title of the world this Saturday night against Jeff Horn. He is universally recognized as one of the best pound-for-pound fighters on the planet, former junior welterweight champion, light super lightweight champion the one and only terence crawford is on the line with yours truly right now what's going on big time how are you man what's going on man i'm good i appreciate you hang i appreciate you coming on the show mm-hmm. first things first uh the the fight was originally postponed uh what injury did you have and how are you feeling now how excited are you about this matchup this saturday well i had a uh deep deep bone bone bruise okay my right hand mm-hmm. that uh kind of popped one of my bones out but it's healed now, and I'm very excited for this weekend, you know what I mean, to put on this big show at this big uh, moment of my career. Now, is this like a seven-pound, correct me if I'm wrong, is this like a seven-pound jump, like 140 to 147? What exactly is the jump here for you weight-wise? Seven pounds, 140 to 147. All right, and how are you feeling about that, man? Do you feel you're going to be stronger? Or are you worried as to whether or not you're going to have some power? Are you worried? I mean, what are you anticipating from yourself this weekend? I'm not worried at all. I feel like I'm going to be stronger, faster. You know, uh, the seven pounds that I was cutting to make 140, I feel like, you know, uh, my body was kind of growing out of the weight class. But at the same time, I still can make the weight comfortably and uh, – I just felt like I'm going to be stronger at this weight. Terrence Crawford right here with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio, fighting for the WBL welterweight crown this Saturday night at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Uh, uh, Terrence, you're universally recognized as one of the best. Obviously, the words, the name Vasily uh, Lomachenko comes to mind a lot of people. He's entirely too small for you, so I don't ever see that fight happening. But where do you rank yourself, and who do you think is the closest guy to you for -for pound-for-pound champion and why? Uh, I think I'm I rank myself number one Mm -hmm. you know I felt like I did a lot of things um, at 140 at 135 um, being undisputed all that all that you know I take in consideration Uh, Lomachenko and Gennady Golovkin 
I I rate them at the top right along with me. Mm-hmm. You know, they've been doing their thing and their divisions, and Lomachenko's moving up in divisions as well. Right. You know, um, had a, he just got a great victory with Linares. Yep. You know, a bigger, bigger uh, opponent than he was. So, you know, you gotta you gotta get that man respect. You know, Terrence, I wanted to share with my audience because obviously you and I have spoken on several occasions in the past, and I know how confident you are in your abilities, and you should be because you're undefeated and you're just superb. I will say this to you though: you're moving up to the welterweight division. Is, was it a weight issue, or is that where the action is, and you just have opponents that you want in that division so badly? Oh well, that's where the bigger, bigger name is. is you know, um, like I said before, I still can make one forty. Mm. You know, but me and my team felt it was best to move up and wait and mix it up with those guys with the bigger names because it would be better off for my career because of the um, opponent that I can uh, face mm-hmm. at the welterweight division. Terrence Crawford, when you talk about going up against this kid, Jeff Horn, uh, I'm not trying to disrespect him in any way. He beat the great Manny Pacquiao. I watched that fight. We covered that fight, okay? In the same breath, you never knew but so much about Jeff Horn until he won that particular fight. What are you expecting from him Saturday night? What are you expecting from yourself as a result? I'm expecting them to come, uh, come, come to the ring, ready to fight from the first bell on to the to the twelfth if it lasts that long. You know, um, he's rugged and he's going to try to push me around. He's going to try to use his head, and I just think he's going to try to do everything in his will to possibly to, you know, get this upset. But me personally, you know. I'm so mentally focused right now that I'm not going to let him do any of that. You know, um, I'm going home with that with that WBO title, and that's that. Are you concerned at all that winning would not be enough, that you need to win in spectacular fashion in order for you to get the fights against some of the more well-known welterweights that you really, really want? Not at all. You know, uh, winning is winning. As long as you get the win, that's all that matters. You know, um, but but me personally, I thrive on looking good every time I step foot in the ring and set an example every single time that I fight, being that, you know, I want to be labeled as one of the greats. So I got to use these type of fights that people think that's going to be hard for me and make mm-hmm. an example out of them. We're talking to Terrence Crawford, uh, junior welterweight, super lightweight, uh, champion of the world, now going for the WBL welterweight crown this Saturday night against Jeff Horn at the MGM Grand in Vegas. Now, you and I have spoken, Terrence, and I, I listen, I know you don't mind. Listen, you ain't scared of anybody. Keith Thurman is on your list. I, I, I've mentioned Sean, Sean Porter. You know, I'm a, I am mean, Kel Brooks is there. We, we know he's had some troubles recently. But the bottom line, and, and I'm an Errol Spence Jr. fan myself. That's me. You feel like you can take them all, but you specifically mentioned uh, Keith Thurman at several times in the past, if I remember correctly. How bad do you want those fights? Is there any particular opponent that you want more than anybody else? Does it matter who you go against? Because I got the sense that you want this guy, Keith Thurman. It doesn't matter. You know, Mm -hmm. my thing is this. I want to be labeled as the number one welterweight in the division. So, you know, uh, whoever... You know, it starts with Jeff Horn right now, and I'm not looking over Jeff Horn. I'm not uh, worried about any of the other guys in the division right now because my main focus is on Jeff Horn. But after that, you know, the sky is the limit. I'm taking on all comers. Now, you don't feel like you need – and I'm not trying to imply that you don't. You feel like you've arrived, like you don't need to get any better. Everybody's always working on their craft, always striving to get better. But it's not one of those situations where you feel like, oh, I might need another fight or two before I fight against some of these well-known welterweight champions. You believe you're ready to go against any of them right now. Is that correct? Right now. So with that being said, so if that being said, I'm going to make the assumption, far be it for me to assume here, Terrence, but I'm going to assume you're going to handle Jeff Horn. I'm going to assume you're going to deal with this brother, whether it's by unanimous decision or KO, you're going to take care of him Saturday night. Who's next on your hit list? Who do you want next immediately? Like I said, you know, me personally, it doesn't matter. I don't, I don't have a list. 
You know, <laughs> my list is Jeff Horn right now, and then the next champion in the division. You know, I want to be become, you know, the first to ever unify and be undisputed in two weight divisions. Mm. You know, so that's my next goal. Mm. So, in other words, if I sat up there and I said to you, you got to make a decision. Keith Thurman or Errol Spence Jr. next. It don't matter? You don't have a preference? Not at all. Not at all. Mm. Like, ain't no, everybody keeps saying Errol Spence. And ain't nobody running from him. You know, ain't nobody scared of him. Like, he's not no boogie <laughs> man. He's not unbeatable. So, you know, I'm I'm here to let everybody know I'm that one that that's willing to step in the ring with anybody. It don't matter who they is. All right. Terrence, Terrence Crawford, I appreciate the time, buddy. But before I let you go, got to ask this question as well. When we think about the welterweight division, most recently we think about the greatness of Floyd Money Mayweather. Obviously, that now that he has retired, you know, we've moved on to other names and what have you. How do you feel somebody like yourself is going to compare to that, not just in the in the ring, in the squared circle, in the squared circle, but marketability-wise? How do you feel you're going to compare in the end when it comes down to all of that? Well, I don't know. You just got to um, wait and see. You know, you got to keep winning, of course, and you got to keep building your brand and see how far you can take it. You know, Floyd was a, a great at, he was great at promoting himself, you know, and, mm-hmm. you know, that's something that, you know, you, you're going to have to do in this sport, and you got to be able to be entertaining. And, you know, I feel like my style of fighting is entertaining. So I just got to do a little more promoting myself. I got you. Terrence Crawford, good luck this Saturday night, my man. I'll be watching. You know that, all right? You take care of yourself, okay? All right, thanks. Thanks a lot. The one and only Terrence Crawford. Fighting for the WBL welterweight crown against Jeff Horn this Saturday night. He looked to conquer a third weight class when he battles again for the WBL welterweight champion, Jeff the Hornet Horn. Ja- Saturday, June 9th at 9.30 p.m. Eastern time, exclusively on the ESPN+. Plus. In anticipation of the super fight, Teddy Atlas sits down with Crawford for Inside the Ring with Teddy Atlas and Terrence Crawford. A one-hour special analyzing the pound-for-pound superstars' biggest fights and his progression to becoming one of the world's best fighters today. Inside the ring with Teddy Atlas and Terrence Crawford reviews Crawford's biggest fight debuts tonight, June 5th, 9 p.m. Eastern time, right tonight on ESPN2. 888-SAY-ESPN is the number of club. That's 888-729-3776. Terrence Crawford's a bad boy, y'all. I just want y'all to know in case y'all haven't seen enough of him. Terrence Crawford's a bad boy. Now, I'm an Errol Spence Jr. guy because Errol Spence is naturally bigger. And so because he's a natural welterweight, if I had to pick him against Terrence Crawford right now, I'd probably pick Errol Spence. I would tell you that Terrence Crawford is a better boxer. I would tell you that Errol Spence Jr. to me has more power at that weight class. And because he has more power at that weight class and because he's stronger at that weight class, I think he might be a little bit too big for Crawford. But I got to tell you something right now. Crawford, pound for pound, is arguably the best in the world. The brother is special. So I would strongly advise all of y'all to watch that fight this Saturday night. Watch him in action. Jeff Horn is rugged. He's not a scrub. I didn't think he should have beaten Pacquiao, but nevertheless, he handled his business. Got to give credit where credit is due. Pacquiao had him in trouble, but then couldn't finish him. Terrence Crawford, if he gets him in trouble, I promise you, he'll finish him. If he gets him in trouble, he'll finish him. Terrence Crawford wants Keith Thurman, though. And Keith Thurman, I like Keith Thurman a lot. But I think Terrence Crawford could beat him. I think he could. Errol Spence Jr. is a different animal. And I know Errol Spence wants Keith Thurman. He thinks Keith Thurman's running from him. Terrence Crawford doesn't mind who he goes against. You heard him. I like fighters like that. That's what it's all about. That's what the game sport is made of. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. That's why I love the UFC so much. Because all of those guys are willing to fight. Got to give respect where respect is due. More to Stephen A. Smith Show on ESPN Radio. I'm back to your phone call specifically in a minute. I'm a one-trick pony, literally. I show up at kids' parties and act cute. That's pretty much it. So excuse me for being bitter when Geico says not only could we save you money on car insurance, but we do more, like give you 24-7 access online, over the phone, or even via our award-winning mobile app. Well, ooh la la, aren't they multi-talented? Hey, I said organic carrots. (laughs) 
Geico. Expect great savings and a whole lot more. You're listening to the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. 888-SAY-ESPN. It's 888-729-3776. Back to the phones we go. Let's go to Omar in Boston. You're live with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. What's up, Omar? How are you? Hey, Stephen A. You're a fearless man, and today's actions by Trump just solidify what you said last year over the airways that he has a personal vendetta. So, you know, I respect you for that. Mm-hmm. Now, my question today is, do you think the NFL's uh, anthem policy, you know, do you think that this is just another way for them to grab ratings or increase viewership? Well, indirect, because- indirectly it is, because you got to remember, they think, they believe, they're making the case. I don't know if this has been factually proven, but they're making the case. They've been losing ratings and they've been losing an audience because of the protest. So if you're trying to rectify the whole protest issue, that has to be the agenda and the incentive behind it. Yes. I mean, I know, you know, they're morally bankrupt. And I feel I mean, I look at it as they're all they're also going to be opening up, you know, new viewers, people who, you know, let me say this. Let me stop you right there. I'm not going to call them morally bankrupt. I know Robert Kraft. He's not morally bankrupt. I know Jeffrey Lurie. He's not morally bankrupt. I know Stephen Ross in the Miami Dolphins. He's not morally bankrupt. There are various owners uh, that are not morally bankrupt. Just because you prioritize business in the bottom line doesn't make you morally bankrupt. It means that in the world of business, the bottom line is your ultimate objective. And sometimes people want you to go against that and compromise yourself with a different form of thinking while still handing out those checks. And if they're the ones cutting the checks as opposed to cashing them, they do have a right to think about that bottom line. Now, it can't be the be all and end all, Omar, but you have a right to at least think about it and take it into consideration when you're making your decisions because the people that are willing to compromise that bottom line, at no time did they say, here's your money back. They never did that. Now, I was, I was questioning more the structure of the rule because I know that, you know, the media is going to be all over the locker rooms before games. And, you know, they're going to get a lot of new viewers who just want to see which player is not coming no, out. No, they're not. You know, they don't get the same viewers. They're not going to get new viewers. People who are watching the NFL are going to continue to watch the NFL. People who aren't watching the NFL – which are very, very few because the NFL has become religion in this country. You might not have a lot of people going to games, but practically everybody's watching it. I mean, listen, we've got rabbis and pastors and everybody else compromising their sermon schedules to make sure they get to, they watch football games. Let's just call it what it is. Got to go, Omar, though. I appreciate the call. J.J. in Charlotte, you're live with Stephen A. Talk to me. Yes, sir. I appreciate you taking my call. I love your show. Thank you. I, I agree that, I agree that uh, President Trump has done a lot of things and said some things. I'm a disabled military veteran. Uh, what I think, though, we, we, we do a bad job lately on is disrespecting the office. And when I grew up in the 80s, when I saw an NBA team or an NCAA team make it to the finals and win, it was always a nice and awesome thing to go see them in front and meet the president, regardless of what political side they were on. Start right I there, JJ. Not- Start right there, JJ. I put you on the spot and ask you this question. Did you feel that way when Tom Brady elected on several occasions not to go to the Oval Office or not to go to the White House? Because he's done it several times. I did. I, I thought it was I thought it was a bad, bad deal. OK, I thought it was a bad idea. Then your, posi- yes, then, your, I then your position is consistent and I respect it. What I will tell you, however, is, is that although I'm inclined to agree with you, we also have to respect the right as American citizens, where if you don't want to go to the White House to see a particular president, that's your right. It's not like folks came out and and excoriated the man. I mean, George W. Bush wasn't excoriated by athletes, by and large. Neither was Obama. Neither was uh, uh, H.W. Bush or Clinton, for that matter. What I'm saying to you is that there are some people who just quietly go about the business of not being celebrated at the White House. And I think that's that's within their right to do that. Can I ask a question, sir? Sure. Sure. Yes, sir. You, you you stated you made a comment about Steph Curry and LeBron James, yes. the popularity. And I and I'm from Charlotte, so I I I love Steph Curry. I I I think the world of him, and I agree. I think they're popu- more popular than the the president of the United States. Mm-hmm. But shouldn't they take it to a further step? And I'm asking 
because I I'm, I want to know what your what you think uh, to do the right thing to do the better thing when these kids look up to them. Oh wait a minute! Say, wait a minute! You know wait a minute! Wait a minute! That depends on what you think the better thing is. Like for example, let me give you an example, JJ. If they sat up there and took their stance and their position based on politics, JJ, I'm totally with you. Fair to then, say. They're not engaging in partisanship. What they're saying is, is the behavior of this particular individual is something that they find to be abhorrent. We have congressmen and senators on Capitol Hill from the same party that have been on the record stating that. What they've said is that it transcends politics. And more importantly, what they're doing is pointing the finger at voters because they're saying that the voters in this country once held all politicians to a certain standard. They may have suspected things, unsavory things, JJ, or whatever the case may be, but you didn't put it in their face and they said, we don't care. We're going to put you in office anyway until I this election. And so, what, and so what happened, and, and I want to make this very, very clear, JJ. I'm not, I might have my own feelings about the president, but I'm very, very big on respecting the office. I'm very, very big on us not getting into the weeds and woods of politics. Number one, because that's not our job here at ESPN. We're a sports network. But number two, and more importantly, JJ, I'm going to tell you something that most people aren't willing to admit. Damn it, if we ain't covering it on a night and night out basis, we just ain't that damn informed. Because there's a lot that goes with or that, that goes on behind the scenes to influence so many of the decisions that we may agree or disagree with that it just appears inappropriate a lot of times to just talk about those things. Now, if you my man Joe Madison to the Sean Hannity's, the Mark Levins, to the Warren Ballantines, the Karen Hunters, and the list goes on and on. Sure, you can do that because you're studying it the way we study sports. But if you're not doing that and you're not following it that religiously, then to just speak willy nilly and all ad lib about it. To me, that's irresponsible. But if you're talking about policy, that is when you're talking about behavior, that's something we can all relate to because it's a standard we all we've all been held to until he got into office. That's the problem. And that's what emboldens and strengthens and augments the arguments of a LeBron James or a Steph Curry. Like LeBron James said, J.J., you have to admit, J.J., I hope you're still there. You have to admit this. LeBron James has never been openly disrespectful to a politician. He called the president of the United States a bum and said, quote, he said he already said he wasn't coming to the White House, you bum. It was always an honor to go to the White House until you arrived. That was the quote that LeBron James gave months ago. J.J., you can't deny the potency of that argument. No, no, sir. I agree. I agree with you. All I'm saying is just just because just because you can doesn't mean you should, if that makes sense. Well, again, again, the point is that you're asking them in their eyes to go and celebrate a man who appears to be since in office the antithesis of everything we have demanded from someone in that office or a role model or a leader. So the problem is not even with President Trump. The problem is with the voters who were willing to ignore all of that because it's a standard that we as a nation have religiously held everyone accountable to, no matter who we are. So instead of getting mad at him, maybe we should be mad at ourselves. I agree, sir. I agree 100 percent. Thank you so much for the call. Appreciate it, JJ. Call back anytime. You see how I did that, ladies and gentlemen? I'm not casting any aspersions on one's politics. We're not talking policy. We're not talking politics. We're talking about living in an age where by virtue of who we elected to put in office at the time that we did, we essentially hold 20, 25 30-year-old athletes more accountable for their behavior than we do the President of the United States of America. At the end of the day, that is the problem that folks are having. 
particularly in the sports world. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you something. You can't argue with them on that. You just can't. Your call to close out the show in a minute with Stephen A. on ESPN Radio. Guess what? You're in the middle of the Stephen A. Smith Show podcast. Damn it, I mean it! Back to the phones we go before we get on out of here. Let's go to Corey in South Carolina. You're live with Stephen A. Go ahead, Corey. Yes, sir. I just wanted to comment on that gentleman who called in earlier from Virginia, the one who got all up in arms about the flag. You know, I'm a 16-year soldier myself, and if I remember correctly, when I took that vow, it said we vowed to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Not the flag, not the anthem. And in the Constitution, it says you have the right to free speech and you have the right to protest nonviolently. Now, I may wish Colin Kaepernick had went about it a different way, but I'll defend to the death his right to do what he did. Gotcha. Appreciate the call. Thank you so much, Corey. Definitely appreciate that perspective. Steve in Pennsylvania, you're live with Stephen A. Go ahead real quick, Steve. Yeah, I absolutely agree with Corey. That's exactly why I was calling in. I was in the military as well, and our country was founded on a, a one great protest. You know, I serve for everybody. I don't care what color you are, who, who you know, what religion you are. Go for it. Is you know, it's between you and your employer as to you know what happens. But I'm all for it. Steve and Corey, thank you both for your service to this country. I really appreciate you calling into the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Let's go to Columbus in Alabama. You're live with Stephen A. Go ahead to Columbus real quick. Go ahead. Hey, Stephen A. Huge fan of yours, man. Look, Thank what you. I find so amazing about this is that the, uh, this man who is president uh, is basically on an investigation for collusion with the Russians. At the very least, he has to have people that are affiliated with him, like the Attorney General and other people that have already proven that they lied and they had contact. So who is needed to question patriotism? And lastly, uh, a lot of those people that are angry about the flag are the same ones that wave the Confederate flag, and we know the history of that with the country. Got anyway, it. I'm enjoying the show, man, and thanks. Columbus, thank you so much for the call. Kevin in Pennsylvania, you're live with Stephen A. you got 45 seconds. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, I think anyone who is rated to draft four times should not be setting the standard for patriotism. And I think the fact that Cal Corver has 25 points in seven NBA final games makes your assertion that he should start in front of J.R. Smith truly indicative of the quizzling boule journalism that you practice, Stephen A. Smith. Well, I agree. I respectfully disagree with you because I'm pointing to the way that J.R. has been shooting. It's not a matter of him being better or worse. It's a matter of the fact that Kyle Korver uh, has been shooting 42% from three-point range throughout these playoffs. He seems to be a better option from long range, and that's that. And in terms of my journalism, I'm not going to debate it with you. I've been doing it for 25 years. My record speaks for itself. I just happen to be hosting television and radio right now. Matter of fact, if more people was out there doing the kind of journalism that I did when I was doing it, bottom line, they'd be breaking more stories. I'll put my resume and my record up against anybody, sir. I've done what I've done. But I do respect the fact that you're passionate and obviously you feel the way that you feel. And because you may disagree with my point of view, you felt the need to take a cheap shot. It didn't work. I got thick skin. I got alligator skin. I'm made for this, my brother. So you can try. You can call back tomorrow, put you back on. Call back the next day, I put you back on. It doesn't really, really matter. You got to know who you're dealing with. I was made for this. I can take it. Keep bringing it. That's why I got this show. I'll talk to y'all in 22 hours from now. Uh, game three tomorrow night at the queue. I will be there because I'm here in Cleveland. I'll come at you in 22 hours. Peace and love. That's just a sample of what you'll hear on the Stephen A. Smith Show. Weekdays at 1 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app.